again. And, and first his of mic all, is really far from her. <laughs> I want to welcome you all to, to this uh, kickoff event for a constellation of programs that we are calling under the umbrella of Journeys, Bridging the Us-Them Divide in the Global Refugee Crisis. And we are so honored to have this distinguished panel of guests with us tonight for a conversation. And the way we're going to run the evening is that we're going to have a conversation among us uh, as opposed to just formal presentations. And then we will have a chance to open it up for questions. And when we do have questions, we're going to ask you to hold, hold off till we get you a microphone because we're, we're taping this. So we want to make sure that we hear your question for, for our uh, opportunity for engagement. So I'm Diane Moore, and I am the director of the Religious Literacy Project and a lecturer here in Religion, Conflict, and Peace. And we, the Religious Literacy Project, is a sponsor of this series of events. And the kickoff event really is appropriate for us because we have this global refugee crisis with numbers that are literally unfathomable to us. Uh, 22 plus million refugees, 65 plus million displaced persons around the world. And aside from the importance and the critical importance of understanding what is causing this massive humanitarian crisis. And that's an important dimension of what we're doing both through the Religious Literacy Project and through my, teach my teaching, and I know many of my colleagues are doing the same. We have to understand the facts and figures. We have to understand the motivations and the causes. Um, but we also need to be able to put a human face to these remarkably uh, tragic experiences that so many people are facing. And that's especially challenging, I think, for us here in the US, and I think in uh, many parts of the, uh, of the, quote, Western world. So that's really the focus for this series of events, is, the, is to bridge these gaps, bridge the us-them divide. And the panel tonight is, consists of both academics and, and artists, and the artistic dimension of this is really, I think, a, an under-explored arena in the academy about what the arts can do to help us understand these larger challenges and also bring a human face and inspire the empathy required, I think, for action and for commitment. And so I'm especially excited about kicking off this series of events with this panel. The other events that are happening will be uh, taking place inside a portal, uh, a shipping crate that will be delivered on the Andover Green sometime tomorrow and it will be with us. It's big and gold. You won't be able to miss it <laughs> if you are, are, are on this side of Andover Hall. And throughout the week, starting on Saturday and through till next Thursday, we'll have a chance to interact in, in a live sessions with people from primarily two different, well, three different locations where there are permanent portals around the world. Uh, the portal in the Harsham internally displaced persons camp outside of Erbil, Iraq. The Berlin uh, migration hub that's, that's located uh, in the heart of Berlin and is uh, for, serving a refugee community there, primarily of Syrians, but of others as well. And then also uh, groups, uh, a portal in Amman, Jordan, and another in Gaza. So we are gonna have an opportunity to interact with people from, from those areas with both uh, formal conversations, planned conversations ahead of time. Uh, Rachel Adi is here. She's a teacher at Cambridge Ringe and Latin School, and she's going to be bringing three classes of hers um, to the portal on Monday to interact with uh, other students in Amman, Jordan. Uh, we also have other planned events with artists and poets and an opportunity for our students through the work that they've been doing in a course that I'm teaching to also interact with, with others thinking about the multiple dimensions of these, of these crises. Uh, issues regarding concern for children, issues regarding issues related to women, um, creative responses to uh, how the world might um, uh, more actively and generatively respond to these challenges. And I just want to, before I briefly introduce our panelists who will introduce themselves, um, I just want to say one of the dimensions that really motivated my excitement about this project, particularly uh, in the shared studios portal. So I've had myself an occasion to work with refugees, or in, internally displaced persons in the Harsham camp in Erbil. I'm doing some other work there, and I've had a chance to visit that camp now three different times. 
and interact with many of the residents there, most of, almost all of whom have been living there for over three years. They're uh, migrants and displaced persons from Mosul, from the, from the fighting in Mosul, and have lived there for three years and will most likely be there for quite a while, even though the fighting in Mosul is over the uh, devastation that's been wrought in their community is profound. And so the future is uncertain for them. <coughs> I was struck by many things, their graciousness, their generosity, um, welcoming me into their home with uh, meager supplies, always refreshments, always uh, uh, food that seemed in abundance, which I know was not the case. But the other thing that I heard over and over when I was meeting with these families is I uh, asked them to share their stories and consistent themes throughout were uh, a concern about the fact that th no one knows about them. Their stories are not known. Their statistics, their massive numbers in the news, uh, a concern that they feel unseen. So that was one big consistent theme. And I think the other theme for me and for us here in the United States was a theme of recognition of the United States role in setting in motion so many of the events that have happened to these people, not direct causes uh, always, but setting in motion the challenges and the chaos that, has, uh, that the country has been struggling with now for several years since, since the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And I was struck both by there was absolutely no bitterness and no animosity toward me as a US citizen. It was more a curiosity about what are people thinking about us in light of what has unfolded. And also a, a concern that one uh, family in particular shared with an encounter they had through the Harsham portal with um, a young adult in the United States somewhere. It was a, it was, that's the only reference I had. Uh, but they had a lovely exchange. It was warm, it was funny, it was generative. Um, but it became clear in that conversation that this young adult didn't even know where Iraq was on a map. And you can imagine, or you, maybe you can't, I, I can hardly imagine what that must feel like to have your life so profoundly disrupted, not wholly but in part by the political actions of, uh, of, a, of a country and have a, 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 a citizen of that country who's interested, who would not have otherwise been there if it wasn't interested because engaged in this portal conversation, but who ge did not have any, any notion of not only the geography of, of the region, uh, but also the, the events that have um, precipitated the, some of the challenges that these citizens face. So information, knowledge, sharing stories, creating that, human connection is a really critical role that all of us can play in this time, even though this crisis seems huge. And small, what seem like small gestures of attentiveness, of care, of concern, of listening and sharing stories, um, I think can make a big difference and can help, I think, hope, hopefully deepen and uh, dignify our, what I would say are currently our um, dismal uh, state of co public conversation around issues of immigration and refugees here in the US. So with that, I just want to say a brief welcome to our guests and a very brief introduction. Anita Fabos, second here to my left, is an associate professor of international development and social change at Clark University. Cheryl Hamilton, to her left, is the director of, international, of the International Institute of New England's Lowell office and creator of the Suitcase Stories series. You'll hear more about that in a moment. Yumalani Malaba Adebo is here in, uh, in the middle there of the, of the two, and she is a multi-genre artist. And uh, Ziad Raislin is a graduate student at the Harvard Kennedy School and the co-coordinator of the Middle East Refugee Service Initiative here at Harvard and in the greater area. So again, uh, before we turn in, turn this over and start to have a, just a general conversation, I want to give a special thanks to Cheryl Hamilton, who really is the curator of tonight's event. Cheryl is the one who introduced us to these three <laughs> 
who has got her finger on the pulse of so many uh, creative endeavors in the local area around artistic uh, both representations and responses to, to challenges that immigrants face in the area. So Cheryl, again, thank you tremendously for your help and uh, connecting us to this wonderful group of people and also for, for your uh, participation tonight. Thank so you. with that, let me, we're gonna go ahead and start. Again, conversation <laughs> here and then we'll open it up for questions. <clears throat> So, so to begin, if each of you could just share um, a little bit, briefly, stories about your connection to the questions that uh, are before us today, but immigra immigration specifically, refugee crisis more broadly, um, we'd love to hear what brings you to this work. Sure, I can get started. Um, thank you for having us. So my, my own story intertwines with immigration. I am uh, Lebanese-Syrian. My dad's from Homs in Syria, and my mom's Lebanese, grew up in Beirut, um, and I moved to Canada when I was 18 for college and law school, um, then moved to New York to work as an attorney, and all my pro bono work during that time was working with uh, victims of sex trafficking, so forced migrants, mainly women from Latin America. Um, and then after six years, I came back to grad school uh, to start at the Kennedy School, and this was just around the time when the Syrian refugee crisis was hitting its peak. And so I'm at the Kennedy School as part of this program funded by the Emirati government that brings 10 students from across the Arab world to study at Kennedy. Um, and so at the very beginning, when we were starting the year, we felt exceptionally privileged to be here and have everything paid for by an Arab government that at the same time is not doing much to help refugees. Um, and so what we wanted to do was try to connect uh, students like us, Arab students at Harvard, uh, two refugees who have been recently resettled in the greater Boston area, uh, and Lowell being probably the biggest hub. Um, and so that's how the Middle Eastern Refugee Service Initiative started. And the idea was, was at the very beginning, we thought there's a ton of Arab students at Harvard, and they're going to easily want to sign up for this and give back. Um, that was the, the first picture of it. And we planned the first event where we would match up students to a refugee. It would be here at, at Harvard. And it just happened that the first event was the day after the Muslim ban came into effect. Um, and so the result of that was only an outpouring of support from the Harvard community. Um, so we ended up having two to one ratio of students <laughs> to, the re to our refugee guests who came down. We were at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Um, and at the beginning of the event, we had two rules. Uh, you're not allowed to say the word Trump. <laughs> um, and you're not allowed to say the word Harvard because we also were trying to demystify this institution. Um, and so we had Arabic food, mostly Lebanese, <laughs> and um, three musicians from the Berkeley College who you all should listen to at some point. They're a Syrian, a Palestinian, and an Iraqi who have formed this band. Um, and between the music and the food, everybody had just an amazing time. Um, great bonds were formed, and that was our first event, um, all with the help of Cheryl, who we basically had gone to and said, you know, we have a lot of students interested, how can we help? Um, and she said, well, there's a ton of need for social connection. Like, there's, there's a lot of services available, but people need to get out and get to know the community. So that was our first event, and it basically became a formula. We would host folks here. Um, each student would connect with another. Um, each Harvard student would be connected to a refugee, and they would commit to one social event. So they would go up to Lowell, they'd, bring the, they'd come down here and do something like go to the movie, something very simple. Um, one student in particular from the School of Public Health um, brought a, a Lonely Planet and marked off all the Arab stores in Boston oh. and like with directions of how to get. So there was a lot of creativity and how, how to connect. Um, and so we ended up having four of these events. We connected approximately 50 refugees to over 100 students. Um, and we, the, the whole point was to connect Harvard students, but to also bring refugee stories to Harvard. And this is the part where I learned the most, um, is by the end of it, the 100 students who'd helped out were mainly not Arabs. They were, as you can imagine, Harvard has a lot of, a lot of students who speak Arabic, uh, just as, as a minor or out of interest. And the journeys that we learned about were not just east to west. Um, there were a ton of students who had 
gone and are doing their PhDs, connected to Egypt, connected to other parts of the Arab world, who were very, very, very motivated to say this, to tell their own story of how we went and found ourselves, we found the hospitality that you talked about. Um, and so at the very end of the year, and again with a tremendous amount of help from Cheryl, we hosted uh, a refugee story event. And there was over 200 students who came, again, same musicians and free Arab, free Lebanese food. Those are like required. Because it's, it's, it's a part of our culture that, that has worked out really well, as long as, it, as we don't argue where the food is from exactly. Um, and the event was attended by over 200 students. Um, and basically everybody got a five to six minute window to go up and tell their stories. And we ended up having 10 speakers, um, five Harvard students and five um, the refugees have been recently resettled and the, the amazing thing was the stories that we heard because some of the stories, some of it was Harvard students who were uh, refugees themselves uh, and so they were sharing a part that like students I knew all year but then they got up on stage and were telling about how they were in a Somali refugee camp and had made the journey over. Um, and then stories of people who found themselves in the East and then the stories of people who've just got here. Uh, Cheryl interviewed a few of the refugees on stage, and one of the ladies who's, who's become a very good friend had been here for three, Plus, three seven months, months, six seven months. months, and had was speaking fluently with Cheryl. Um, so in, in English, she didn't speak English when she came here to this wow. country. So within six months, she did enough that she could do presentations. Yeah. Um, so we're continuing the initiative. This Friday, we are loading up a bus and taking students up to Lowell because it's time that we visit our, the friends that we made up there. Um, and I'm, I'm learning a tremendous amount. Oh, that's <laughs> really wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, sure. I want to qualify this. I keep saying because of Cheryl. Um, I don't always curate a panel just to have them talk about me. Um, <laughs> I did it because each of these people I highly respect, and they're not people I get chances to sit and actually talk to like this. I mean, we're all running around doing our thing, so I really just asked them to come so I could hear from them. Um, so my background is I've been I, one of those weird people that got a degree in refugee studies and then got a job immediately after college in it, and I've been in the field for 20 years. Um, I've worked locally, nationally, and internationally, um, primarily in refugee resettlement. Um, so I wear a hat as Director of Partner Engagement at the International Institute of New England, and we are the, one of the oldest nonprofits serving refugees and immigrants in the New England area. We work out of Greater Boston, Lowell, and Manchester, New Hampshire. We're 98 years old, um, and we provide everything from showing up at the airport, moving people into their first home, all the way through citizenship services at five years. Um, and as you can imagine, it's been a very challenging year. I will get to those remarks later. The other hat I wear is I'm also the volunteer director of an organization called Mass Mouth. And Mass Mouth is a nonprofit that promotes the timeless art of storytelling. You all can walk across the campus over to Club Passim on the third Monday of every night and see our shows and throw your name in a hat if you want. But we do shows all over the city. And the last thing, I guess, the connection for today is that Anita and I also do shared research around what we call shared worlds or shared worlds question mark. Like, what is the relationship between foreign and US born residents in this country, and even those in between that are transnational? And we'll talk about that. On a personal level, um, I am also a playwright and storyteller. And many years ago, I guess 10 years ago, I did a play about my experience in Lewiston, Maine, when the Somali migration occurred right after 9 11, that just changed everything for me in terms of my goals and my career. I planned to go into refugee camps, and suddenly I didn't need to because refugees were in my hometown. And it made me look at America differently. It continues to make me look at America differently. And I've been thinking about it a lot right now because it feels like deja vu. The most critical thing that happened in Lewiston 20 years ago was that the mayor wrote a letter to the Somali refugees who had chosen to move to Lewiston from other cities and essentially said, you're not welcome anymore. We need to stop. We're economically, physically, and emotionally maxed out is exactly the words he said. And I thought that was gonna be the worst time in my career. I was hoping that would be the worst time. And then the election occurred, and I, I'll be frank, I never cried so hard, I don't think in a long time, because I knew it was gonna have an immediate impact. We were gonna lay off staff, which we did, which meant less services for clients. We were gonna see clients being persecuted and harassed, and worse, as we've seen, you know, kept from entering this country, and I have many stories around that, that I just thought, oh, God. <laughs> but 
I took those lessons from Lewiston and as much as I've been able to with my colleagues apply some of the things we learned in Lewiston. Because I think 20 years later there's moments that I think we've improved. And the best example of that is 20 years ago there would not have been thousands of people at Logan. No question about it. That would not have happened. So that's an improvement. But the challenge is in 20 years we still haven't got better at talking across these lines. And there's things that I think that we even as advocates do that alienate people from being supportive of refugees. And I'll leave my comments there. Thank you, Shannon. Hey, your, uh, your bio was, you, was so rich. I just said multi, multi <laughs> purpose <laughs> artist. <laughs> so please, so thank you for okay. being with us. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so, my connection to this topic really stems from I am a daughter of a refugee. Uh, my father is um, Debele, He's, we're from Zimbabwe. And uh, there are two major tribes, Dembele and Shona, and my parents are actually are from two different tribes and they got married, which is interesting, but they got married here, so maybe that speaks to it being neutral zone over here. Um, but in any event, um, my father's tribe was being persecuted in Zimbabwe. This was in the um, late 70s, um, certainly moving into 1980s in what was Rhodesia at the time. Um, and now is Zimbabwe. And so he came here to America, went to school, and I was born here and raised in the continent. So my connection is twofold. One is my father you know, was a refugee and he came here for political asylum. He was really involved heavily in politics when he was um, a young man in Zimbabwe and came here and found refuge. I was born here and then raised in the continent, so I grew up in post-independent Zimbabwe. And then I came here as an adult. And so while I didn't come here through the trauma that one does, you know, if you are um, from war torn countries, which many of the um, refugees are, I do have some of the challenges um, that one faces when you're coming into this sort of new world. And how do you connect and engage and figure out what do you leave behind and what do you um, connect with or keep of your particular culture? Um, so that's sort of my connection. Um, as an artist and as an educator, one of the things that I do is really make sure that my students who happen to be first generation immigrant students really understand the gifts and the um, inherent skills they already have when they come into the classroom. Oftentimes um, they're looked at as being negative or that they come here empty vessels and in America they will be filled up with whatever America decides to put in their minds. And I remind them that is not the case. They come with native skills that are really um, powerful and impressive and really they can navigate this world, um, this state, and this country much better, I think, because they're looking at things and problem solving in different ways. As an artist, some of the work that I've done is really explore this idea of identity and hyphenation. Uh, because I was born in America but raised in the continent, I have a very interesting perspective on what it means to be American. Um, I carry the passport, but I'm very much an African woman who is here in America, and so I look at things with a very interesting lens. And creatively speaking, my work really sort of is a dance between those two, and the tension, sort of the love and the war between those two things. Um, so that's, I'll just stop there. There's more I could unpack, but those are some of my connections. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. And Anita, thank uh, you I think of myself mostly as a researcher and a teacher involved in refugee studies, and I uh, started my research fr from my early training as an anthropologist in the 90s, uh, where I was living in Cairo, uh, doing work with uh, a growing number of refugees from different Horn of Africa countries, and then Sudan and South Sudan. Um, and I uh, you know, grew to understand certain things about um, belonging and exclusion and uh, ambiguity around being a, a person of a refugee background trying to somehow uh, fit in into a very big multicultural cosmopolitan city like Cairo. Um, and that experience um, prepared me, I think, to start thinking about teaching refugee studies as a as a as a, a subject of of of, of um, uh, you know a, a curriculum as well as a subject of research, and what does it um, require for somebody to really understand not just the individual um, stories, the uh, larger uh, social um, concerns and and crises and emergencies, but also longer histories and contexts and how things have changed and stayed the same. 
And uh, so I've been involved with three different refugee studies programs, um, one in Cairo at the American University in Cairo, uh, one in London at the University of East London, um, and then right now we're working on pulling together our, uh, our resources to build a refugee studies program at Clark University as well. Um, but all of this professional work really does mine some of my early personal background. So in the 50s, my father was a refugee from Hungary. And uh, in those days, also, you know, going back to what some of my colleagues have said, things have changed um, quite significantly uh, in terms of um, both who was arriving as refugees, what kinds of welcomes there were, what kinds of resources there were, um, and what kinds of expectations there were too. So although my father um, was a, a proud man, a proud Hungarian, um, identified with his uh, um, rural background as a farmer, um, people were not interested in hearing the story. So that really resonated for me when you were describing these stories unheard. And I think in the back of my mind, although I wasn't uh, originally studying refugees, uh, it, these ideas continue to speak to me um, over the years. And uh, indeed, my father's uh, uh, story um, was not interesting even to his own wife, who was also an immigrant. Because I think at the moment, I mean, at that, at that moment in, um, in the 50s and early 60s, really the uh, ideas around being American were all about fitting in, all about being that empty vessel where you speak English, you learn um, the right way to say things, not the ways that I you know, sp spoke things. And so I, I guess, um, looking back, my um, early childhood was a little bit awkward because I didn't quite fit in. Um, and there were always ways where I wasn't quite catching, catching on to the, 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 the correct um, English words for things and so forth. So in the back of my mind, I think um, the lens of being you know, definitely privileged um, by my whiteness and privileged by my education and all of that, um, it does uh, make me reflect, though, on how important those early experiences were in giving me um, a, a kind of an understanding of the bigger picture of uh, the ways that societies also think about refugeeness and think about mobility and uh, um, um, miss some of the, 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 miss the, the sort of the smaller stories, as you were saying, but they also miss some of the bigger stories of our collective mobile history and how it's uh, woven through uh, many of our societies and so forth. So, um, that's, I think, one of my reasons for wanting to continue to develop these refugee studies programs where we can think about it collectively and, and, and maybe change some of the discourse around um, uh, you know, people who, have, who come from mobile backgrounds. Right, right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, so each of you brings such complementary skills and perspectives on this incredibly complex confluence of issues that have has come together to create what we're calling the global refugee crisis. And the, there is one piece of, I think, good news in the midst of all this, that the scale of it has actually now put this on people's, in people's consciousness. So there's been a lot that's happened over the last year and a half around uh, particular representations of the crisis, I want to say, because there have always been crises going on, and there's also many humanitarian crises around the world right now that we, we don't even know about famines in Africa that pe people don't even know that show up nowhere in the news. But within the context of this particular year, what kind of lessons uh, have, have, have you learned or that you could represent for us? And what uh, ideas can you share with us about the perspectives about what you've heard and where what we might do uh, in this particular time to respond more creatively than we've been able to? Um, and I'd love to hear your perspectives from your unique um, uh, vantage points. So, Anita, why don't you go ahead and start with us? Sure. The work that I started in the Middle East um, really set my agenda for looking at refugee issues from not just here, but also there, uh, as it were. Uh, and one of the observations that 
I think is useful um, is that Middle Eastern societies have been living with refugees for decades, and um, I think that people who haven't had so many so much experience with refugees um, and the transformations that uh, societies go through to um, work with, work among, and and have um, refugee populations um, uh, can you know can give us this this sort of background. But I think um, the reason that my work in the Middle East uh, was important to me is that the Arab and Muslim world really have a history of movement and mobility. Um, before, you know, many of you are probably better historians than me, um, but you'll know that prior to being uh, individual states like Lebanon and Syria, Lebanon and Syria used to be, you know, part of the Ottoman Empire and after the, the British Empire, or sorry, the French, um, and uh, there was always a lot of movement um, from one big city to another. There was a lot of trade. There was a lot of um, um, movement to seek learning. Um, there were a lot of um, Muslim theologians uh, bringing um, spiritual guidance around. And I started thinking about statehood and state identity in a different way, I think, just because of the um, the, the, the fluid history of, of movement and identity um, in many Middle Eastern contexts, um, but also the sense of shared cultural and religious uh, identity. And um, it came to my attention, and this is, again, something that would be um, analogous, I think, for earlier uh, um, Christian um, you know, global concepts of identity and belonging, but for sure, what I understood was still the case for many um, Muslims and Arabs was that there was a shared umbrella concept of belonging that um, didn't go away if you had a different passport from somebody else in the um, in this in the region, and that has really shaped the way that refugees have been um, treated and thought of in Middle Eastern countries. It's not all uh, sweetness and light, I must say, um, and especially with um, you know the growing uh, discourse around terrorism, which, as many Middle Eastern scholars will know, you know definitely predated 9/11. Mm -hmm. um, these uh, ideas about terrorism and Middle Easterners were um, emerging before that, um, and uh, uh, the borders were becoming more and more um, secure and patrolled. Uh, but nevertheless, these shared identities and shared um, uh, uh, sort of spiritual uh, belonging was there, and I think it still um, ref is reflected. And I definitely saw that when I was in Cairo. Um, uh, you know, there, there was, um, you know, a back and forth about what, um, what unit a person would belong to. So um, a lot of my research among um, my Sudanese research participants, you know, it was uh, um, hard to completely separate oneself away from the Egyptian um, place of refuge 100% uh, um, because there was a shared language, there was a shared history, there was a shared struggle against colonialism. Um, so the us against them idea uh, was, was much more ambiguous, I think. Um, and then, let's see, uh, today, I think maybe bringing it to the current context, Jordan is such an interesting place, isn't it? Because um, even though there is a large number of refugee uh, refugees living in Jordan, probably um, uh, second to Lebanon, I think, at the moment for Syrian refugees, um, but Leban uh, sorry, Jordan um, has designated individuals as guests. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a tradition of welcome that uh, is, is sort of not quite part of the international legal framework of refugee protection. So there are some um, anxieties around whether people will truly always be guests and maybe the Jordanian state could turn around and say, um, okay, it's time for your visit to end. Um, so there's always those um, anxieties there. I wouldn't uh, consider it necessarily an alternative model um, to uh, to what we're uh, seeing in, uh, like in the European uh, context and so forth, um, but uh, so you know contrasting the the Middle East to some of these uh, some of the ways that refugees have been um, uh, 
uh, thought of in the international state system. I think uh, one of the observations that many of us are, are starting to make from the academic context is that the idea of there being a state solution, like either refugees go home to their home state or they fit in and become citizens of their current place of, of, of refuge, or a place like the United States welcomes them and resettles them as, um, as citizens of that state, you're seeing more and more resistance to those ideas. You're, it's, it's harder and harder for various reasons for people to think about going back to um, countries of origin now. And so there are populations of refugees um, out of place in, in many, many parts of the world um, without uh, a, a clear sense by the by the international system, by individual countries, that those individuals will be somehow reabsorbed as citizens of another state, which was very different from the from World War post World War II era, mm -hmm. and so some of the most interesting research that's or and, and think policy thinking are, you know, what kinds of alternatives are there to, um, on the one hand, being a citizen of a of a country. Um, or living as an exiled person for a decade after decade, which is um, facing so many um, people. And I think, Diane, you mentioned that about Syrians have no um, necessary expectation of going back to, uh, or Iraqi, sorry, Iraqi, um, going but, back but to uh, Mosul. Similar. Right. Um, and uh, so some of these um, uh, new ways of thinking about home and homemaking are emerging, different ways of thinking about durable solutions. Maybe um, there's some interesting work by a couple of people who used to be at the UNHCR thinking about mobile protection because people on the move um, are, are somehow only given protection when they're in a state. But what would it look like if people's protection moved with them? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, people are thinking about uh, different different um, approaches, which gets gets us uh, sort of more recognizing even more that we are at an impasse with our current legal system right, right. and our current uh, inter, in, you know, interstate uh, protection mechanisms for refugees. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think your question was about lessons, uh, and I think the last year had a ton of lessons, but I'll, <laughs> I'll focus on two, one on work in America and then uh, Europe and sort of contrast them. Um, I, I'm, I was an eternal optimist in America's ability to welcome refugees and I continue to be. Um, I think America, unlike any other country in the world, has the ability to make you feel like you're American. Um, and I remember the day that the Muslim ban came out, um, that was probably the only 24 hours of doubt, a very serious doubt I had. And it's, it's very intricately involved with who I am. And so I just felt unwelcome here. Um, and I was very seriously considering that this is not where I want to stay. But the event the very next day showed the whole other side. There's this counter force uh, to, to the ban. And, and we see it especially in places like, like Cambridge. Um, I cannot tell you, but the number of people who came up to me and said, this is not who we are. And it's, it, it's, it's, it was as, as if it was a wake-up wake call for people to show uh, their colors, and attorneys especially took such a huge role in going to airports around the country. Um, and so on one side, to me, the American story continues to be a unique ability to, to integrate um, and to make you feel at home, um, despite the rhetoric. And on the other side, we spent, and, and this is to all the Harvard students and the audience, uh, there's a Harvard Trek service trek that, that happens every year um, to go work with refugees. And so this year it was to Lesbos uh, in Greece, and we spent a couple weeks at a, at a refugee camp. Um, basically, it was co-sponsored with Google, and so we would spend half the day uh, doing design thinking around issues that the camp has identified as the most important. So residents of the camp have said our issues were cooking, employment, uh, very, some of the very simple things, but that needed a response. The, the third was cooling, because all the units had air conditioners, but there was no electricity. And so the summer was coming, and you had all these units with air conditioners, but not an ability to turn them on. So luckily, we had some Harvard engineers who came up with a, with a um, device that can be just run on water and provided some cooling for the summer. Um, so it was a very real trip of, of here's issues, uh, put all your Harvard intensity towards good, not just getting grades. 
uh, and let's <laughs> do something for this camp. Uh, and it was wonderful. It was one of the best treks that I've ever been on. Um, but there, the story is very different than the story in America in that there were a ton. Um, so I was involved in the employment group. And we went around and got the skills of everybody in the camp to try to identify what they can do. And so I have this Excel sheet of the 900 residents, and you would be just amazed at the amount of skills available, um, especially the group of 25 or 20 to, to 30 year olds who are just sitting in the camp doing nothing all day, but who were otherwise in university in Damascus and had to flee. Uh, Syria was, was a functioning country just five years ago, and so people do have education and skills. But there is absolutely no way that a Syrian refugee is going to feel at home in Greece in a way that they can eventually feel in, in the US. And so it's something's got to give. It's, it's, we need to start reframing the story from refugees to, to human capital and human potential. Uh, because we were forced to view the issue through that because we were trying to connect them to employment. And we were amazed at the skills available. Uh, but that's not how we have the discussion. That's not the discussion in Europe and, and even here. Great. Thank you. I'll go. Um, so I'll talk about this from a practitioner point of view. As I said, we work with the, directly with the clients. Uh, historically, Massachusetts would have resettled 1,800 refugees annually out of the 70,000 designated for the United States. That has obviously since decreased. We're only anticipating in Massachusetts 900 in the coming year because we, President Trump has reduced the amount resettling to 45,000 um, in the whole nation. Um, and so I guess there's, like you said, there's so many mess messages and lessons for us this year. Number one is just very simple, right? We have to stop being complacent. I think that, and I don't mean this in a partisan way. I'm gonna speak specifically to resettlement. Resettlement has always had bipartisan support for since 1980. And in fact, you saw that the day after the executive order banned resettlement um, for 120 days. It was actually Republican senators and congressmen coming out saying, whoa, 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 wait, what are we doing here? And so, but the thing was, we sort of became complacent about resettlement. It's just something we bring refugees in, but it didn't really get connected, in my opinion, to a global conversation of like, is this a solution? Is just a shared, some people call it burden sharing. Like what is the role and where are we leading or following or fitting in with this conversation? Um, so for me, I thought, you know, after the executive order was affected, resettlement agencies like this, so this is me calling an action step, we're federally funded. So it's very challenging for us to be the advocates asking for increases in resettlement. I mean, we're funded based on each arrival. So I can say I'm frustrated, but I have to look to the community to say, if you would like refugees in your community, we need your voices stepping up. So that's number one. Number two is to um, Ziad's point, there was many depressing days. The January 27th, I was standing on the corner in Lowell of Merrimack and Central, and I got a call from my boss saying, it's, it's done. There's a ban and, it's, and there's a suspension. And we literally had a family from Syria that was supposed to come that weekend. And that family had waited for years. I mean, the average length of someone spends in exile is 17 years. So it, it's not just a pause. It could have been forever for them. I'm very happy to say we were able to get them back once it was overturned. They are now here. They're doing wonderful. The whole family's working. The mother got the medical attention she needs. So it was great. But shortly after that depressive moment <laughs> um, was the calls. It was a ridiculous outpouring of support. Now, I recognize we're in Massachusetts. I worked in Maine. That is a very different feel. But it was a nice feel. <laughs> we started getting calls from everybody. New York Times was in our lobby, being like, we want to write about this. What was interesting is they wanted to write about some refugee who was depressed, which there were many. And I said to them, don't write that story. Everyone in this country is going to write that story. Talk about how Lowell refugees have transformed communities in New England. And I'm really happy to say that's the story they read, ran on the front page of the news. And we have an opportunity to, like, when we talk about bridging us and them, we can create that conversation. Like, you actually have the control. You don't have to just respond to the media. You can direct the media. Um, the ironic problem I've had for the first time in my career, and it is a problem that many nonprofits face, is when you get an outpouring of support, it was too much. Like, how do you coordinate thousands of people? We had a waiting list of 450 people wanting to volunteer. Two months before the executive order, we had five volunteers. 
-hmm. And people were getting frustrated with us. You're not using our help. You're not using us. And I'm like, I have a staff of seven people that are trying to help 75 families. Yes, I understand you want to help, but there's two problems. One is I don't have capacity immediately. And secondly, let's be honest, you have to first educate people about how to help. And that is time intensive. So we found a way to, you know, Ziad was just patient with me. I was like, yeah, yeah, eventually I'll get you some families. Um, and I'm thankful because they've done more than I even knew about because we just were like, go, you know? But other groups required a lot of handholding. And there were some moments that for me, when I sit back and reflect, that are important to consider. One is that I had many, many well-intended public members say, I really want to help. And I'm like, that's great. I want to help a Syrian. And I said, well, 50% of arrivals are Congolese across the whole country, because we agreed to welcome 25,000 Congolese. Oh, no, no, I'm not interested in helping a Congolese. Mm -hmm. OK. And one even went so far to say, because they wouldn't get in the news for helping. Mm -hmm. And I, I get, like, you're, whoever you're inspired by, all of us were brought to this work. I was inspired by Somalis. I, I'll, I have a bias towards Somali refugees, because I work with them. I, you know? But this really important question to ask. The other thing is, and this is what Anita and I have spent a lot of time with, is we say we're a nation of immigrants, we say we're integrated, but when all of the support the last year has been, what can I give, what can I do for a refugee? I know it comes from a good place, but it creates a power dynamic. And it actually doesn't mean I will share my life with them. I mean, many clients, uh, well-intended volunteers will literally, we had this happen last month, a well-intended person came to interview someone for a mock interview to help them prepare for a job. And the first question was not, what was your profession? They said, so tell me about how bad it was. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't tell people the worst thing that happened to me when I meet them. Um, but these really are just occasional moments, but they're worth talking about. Um, and so what does integration look like? How does that happen? How do we create that? And there's another thing, which is there was a lot of rose-colored glasses in the first days. Like, we want to help, we want to help, we want to help. And I would say, um, why don't we just start with like showing up to an event? They're like, no, no, give me a family. And I think that's because you saw in Europe these Germans standing at the airports, opening their arms, having dinner with people. Follow those stories up and ask me where those families are today. Everyone was pointing to Canada. Canada has the secret solution for resettlement. We're going to raise $30,000. We're going to adopt a family. It's all going to be good. If you look at the New York Times pieces now, those same families who opened their hearts up were like, ooh, this is hard, actually. How do I get rid of that family? How do I stop working with that family? Is that family sufficient? We started, now, the good news is, there really is more good news than not, but I just want to remind us of this. We were able to, the first time in 10 years, start a welcome team project that did match families with refugees. We started small, three. <laughs> And the families on both sides really liked it. But it's because we asked of them more to do the social stuff. Now, they, they helped with housing and jobs and health and everything. But for me, it was when they took them to a movie and when they took them out, because we're not paid and we don't have the capacity to do that. In fact, a social worker is not, in fact, supposed to become friends with your clients, right? It's a weird dynamic for me. I know a lot of refugees, and I have to not go to their homes sometimes. Um, but the one thing I want to say, uh, so this friendship happened, and last week I got to go to the reflection session of the volunteers, and they just said things like the most rewarding experience of their lives, you know, that they thought of themselves differently, they thought of their biases differently, they thought of their privilege differently, like all these really important things said. But I will never forget the person who said, resettlement's really hard. <laughs> I said, yes. This is what resettlement agencies are doing. It's hard work, but the harder work is done by the clients. I mean, 120 days, they have to be self-sufficient upon arrival. Their funding runs out. You have to pay for first month's, last month's security with $1,125. Imagine doing that in Boston. Not possible. Not possible, no. I mean, but they make it possible in Lowell and Manchester and by sharing rooms. It's, it's remarkable. Um, but the last thing I want to have you think about is I don't think it's President Trump that's going to kill resettlement in this country. He certainly has made it a lot harder. <laughs> um, but resettlement was already threatened by the fact of how it's funded. It's slowly drying up in urban areas, which is resettling refugees into rural communities where different questions are posed. And they're honestly sometimes more fair. Are there enough jobs? Is there enough housing? So if the affluent urban areas can't change resettlement to make it affordable, 
We're not resettling refugees in this country. Wow, so much information going on. Um, so many things that I'm thinking of. Um, I think one of the lessons, at least, that I learned um, is that um, in, in Boston, people seem to come together. And in particular, I was very moved by um, folks going to the airport and really standing up. Um, I was very moved by that. Um, but I think we have to be a more intentional. Um, and I'm speaking here as both an artist and as, as an educator. I mean, I'll give examples of what I mean. Um, I was involved in a project called American Therapy, and it was in September and on, in the early parts of October, and essentially it was an installation that was in three different locations, and we just asked ordinary citizens how do they feel about America, what's going on, and in every space, they always were concerned about what was going on with immigrants and refugees, which means that we, you know, that is really in the forefront of people's mind. Um, and so basically we had conversations with them one-on-one -on -one and poets and visual artists were really creating work based on that um, conversation. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of power in that one-on-one -on -one conversation we had with strangers from all walks of life in different parts of Boston. Um, and so that was a really practical and engaging way to really figure out what's going on um, in the minds of Americans. The other thing I'll say is being intentional about being in the classroom as educators, really understanding and knowing who the audience is that we have in our classroom. As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm, I'm a professor at uh, Endicott College. I teach creative writing, academic inquiry, those kind of classes. And my students are first generation immigrants. Some of them have you know, come from uh, war-torn countries, I'm thinking of Haiti, some you know, natural disasters, and they come into my class and the first thing I say is, tell me what your story is of home. What do you want to share with me about home? Not did you have a terrible experience, but I want you to hold on to a particular memory and use that as a starting point for how you're going to be in this space, bringing the native skills and the native experience in the space. The other thing that I do that's, you know, that's hard to do sometimes, but I really um, make it part of my practice is find people in the communities where they live to come into my classroom and talk to the students. In particular, in cases like um, when they're doing, um, when they're exploring uh, job careers, something like that. I'll have people from the neighborhood come in and talk about you know, what did they do? How did they start their local business, the bodega down the street? Um, or I'll have some friends of mine who are from Cape Verde come and talk to the students about their journey, where they went to school, what was difficult, what was hard. So they get real examples of people just like them who've gone through you know, some examples and experiences, but they can really give them sort of a real um, life scenarios of what it's like. And also, of course, sharing my own story. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, now I just lost my train of thought. Oh, yes, um, Saeed had talked about um, you know being really surprised at the skills that you mentioned about the skills they already had um, coming into the country. And I think that's really important, recognizing that people aren't empty vessels when they come in. And so really ask them what it is that they know how to do versus thinking about that you already know what they're bringing to the table. And recognizing that many of the, the you know, um, refugees that come already have bachelor's degrees, have been doctors and lawyers in their respective countries, and they've just been, you know, at the refugee camp, like you said, doing nothing, um, but really wanting to use their skills, being desperate to do so. And when they come over here trying to find ways, I think it's the onus is on organizations like yours is trying to find ways to make sure that they're able to continue um, or find pathways to continue what they are doing. And I think that's really the challenge. Um, on a, in another hat I wear is I'm a parent. <laughs> and um, I think it's incredibly important to be involved in the school system as parents, um, as folks who take care of kids to really make sure that their voices are heard within the space education space. So that means how do we connect with parents? Um, how do we connect with refugee parents and immigrant parents to engage in their children's learning? How can they bring the, the, the school officials, bring that um, their cultures into the space to really make it feel like it, they belong mm -hmm. and to honor their spaces both in language um, and in experience? So there's many layers, but I think we're, I think there's certainly, I've seen a lot of um, movement at least, you know, in the 
in the um, organizations I've been involved with, the Boston Public School has a citywide parent council. I'm very involved in that, and I think it's really important to have other voices. Otherwise, we just have 12, or 12 people just sort of shaping everything without mm -hmm. having um, immigrant voices present to really say, no, actually, this may not work. Um, for, I'll give you an example. When you're thinking about a fundraiser for my son's school, they wanted to hold it um, in a location which was very Irish focused, you know, and that's fine, except that the diversity of the students are not reflected. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, you need to think about either a neutral place or a place where everyone can get to, but it's not going to feel like it's dominating one culture. Mm -hmm. And just being able to say that and people hear that, I think, is really important. Um, and the same way with being very intentional about bringing literature and writing and, and creative things into the classroom that reflect the diversity of your students so that you're not just you know, talking to them about English literature that has nothing to do with their culture. And that means us as educators really need to work the extra mile to find stuff that reflects our students so that their work is engaging. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you. We're, we're going to open it up for questions. So as you're preparing, please, again, we've got a couple of mics. <laughs> Uh, that will we'll roam around. But let me just say one thing. I mean, I think an important dimension of what I'm hearing uh, from all of your contributions is this, the challenge of what it means to change the narratives. Mm -hmm. Not just change the narrative of, the, of refugees and immigrants as threats and threatening. And unfortunately, we have a long history of that here in the US. So this isn't unique to our contemporary situation. But it's, 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 it's so changing the narrative, so not, not the, 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 the enemy or the, the people who are going to take away our jobs or who are threatening to us in terms of their bringing criminality into, into the country. It's also, though, shifting the narrative from, from the notion that we uh, only have, so, we, we are the ones who have something to offer. So the, the potential for a, a more paternalistic response, which I think is, is, a, is a great danger among us for, w with all the best intentions. And for me, the, the image is what does it mean to shift the narrative to say we need, we need people of diversity to make us who we say we are as Americans. If we really are a community of refugees, and we are, by the way, factually. I think that's the other uh, terrible, horrible irony of this, of course. Everyone, every one of us here except the native peoples who inhabited this land for just tens of thousands of years before Europeans and others came. We are really, truly all immigrants. <laughs> but what does it mean to say, to sh shift that narrative to say we need one another? And that is a, such a rich, possibility, um, and that's a, we're a long way from that, but I feel like that, there, that nature of that narrative shifting, I think, is, is key to, to representing the kind of dignity that's required and the sense that we are, uh, I, I deeply believe that our, our current representation of ourselves is harmful to those of us who are in positions of privilege as well, because it's a diminishing humanity a diminishing representation of humanity that we are participating in uh, promoting, I think, by our, by our silence or by our uncertainty about how to respond. So with, with that, let's open it up. Let's hear from, hear from uh, people. We, we've got, uh, yes, go ahead. Let's get, we've got a microphone right here. In the middle. And if you could say who you are, please, and just uh, briefly, that would be great, too. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting panel and rich discussion. My name is Jenny Stevens. I'm a professor at Northeastern University, mm -hmm. and I focus on climate change and also issues of energy. And so I'm very interested in any perspectives on climate refugees and also particularly what's happening with Puerto Rico with the migration of people because of the you know, de devastation of the energy system. Um, the numbers I've heard of people moving from Puerto Rico to Florida and other parts of the United States, um, I mean, the rest of the United States, I know Puerto Rico is the United States, that's why it's a part of the challenge there. But um, so I'm curious what thoughts you have or of the narrative associated with that and how that connects with um, other, other things that you're working on and, and thinking about. 
Great, thank you. I'm going to suggest that we take a few questions and get them out on the, on the floor and then have uh, our panelists respond. But excellent question and a really crucial one uh, that ties these questions together. Thank you. Other questions, other comments? Yes, go ahead, Carlo. Thank you. Hi, thank you guys for being here. That was so informative. Um, my name is Harlow. I'm one of Dan's students in the class you mentioned. Um, I have two connected questions. Um, one is, I wonder if you can delve deeper into the balance or the line between feeling American and feeling integrated and also not coming as a blank slate and being able to, to you know, not have to erase everything from before you might come to America, and then with that, how do you ever worry about, and then if so, how do you kind of buffer against uh, the, the possibility of like fetishizing the exotic in telling and hearing stories? Thank you. Any others for the, just to get on the floor? Yes, thank you. This was just one brief comment in terms of something that you said a little bit earlier that sounded um, very Ben Carsonian, I would say, when you just talked about um, that this land in North America was settled by Indians for many thousands of years and that we're all immigrants, but that's the clarification should really be about Afro-descended peoples here being um, from being enslaved Africans. So just that clarification. Critical, critical point, thank you. Um, so my question is, I'm very interested in the, well, I understand the necessity of changing the narrative, right? I don't, let me preface this by saying, back up a second, that I don't really know much about the dynamics of social change and how it happens. And I know that people study this and that there are theories about it, right? So what I would like you to comment on is, what's the relationship between quote unquote changing the narrative and some of the ways that you are all doing it and actually affecting a change in a law or a program mm -hmm. at, say, the, the state level. So that's my question. Okay, I think we'll, we've Can got I a lot on the table here, so let's, I'm just gonna oh let gosh, you I'll all choose to respond to whatever question mm -hmm. this moves you. So go ahead, Sharon. All right, I'm trying to be brief. But I, and I'm gonna, I really appreciate what you just said because I'm sometimes seen as controversial on the topic of how we talk about immigrants and refugees, and I'm not, and like all of us, I'm still coming to my own decision. But I actually have a problem sometimes with the fact we always say we're a nation of immigrants, but I have a problem with it, particularly in one context, and it's how we talk to people who are anti-immigrant. In Lewiston, Maine, when people would ask questions about money or about school or about even their concerns about Muslims because we really were not exposed, a well-intended immigrant advocate would be like, well, we're a nation of immigrants, how can you not be supportive? That doesn't answer their question. In fact, all you've done is alienate people further. And so, even if we are, and then there's the question of, are we? Now, sure, historically we are, but I am second generation and I feel no immigrant connection. And that has to be strange, because I work in this field. And I think it's, we've proven in research over and over again that second and third generations either were encouraged not to identify with their immigrant history, or just don't, because we're becoming increasingly global. I come from a family where half my family voted for Trump, they love Trump, and half my family, I think, supports me. <laughs> Not always sure. <laughs> um, but I'm struggling in my own family to have these conversations. But the things and the small things, I'll just try to summarize all those questions, is what each of you talked about was labeling and identifying and putting people in boxes, right? Are you an El Salvadorian unaccompanied minor? Are you a refugee? Are you an immigrant? And as a service provider, the narrative I'll share is that funding drives those awkward boxes often. We can't serve asylum seekers until they're granted asylum. We can't give the same resources to a refugee because our city government or our state government doesn't allow us to. But if you sit with a mother who is fleeing gang violence and you sit with a Somali woman who is fleeing genocide, they have more in common. So very quickly I'll say how I personally have tried to tackle it this year, which is I launched a series called Suitcase Stories. It was something I wanted to do for years and I guess it just worked out, the timing. And Suitcase Stories is a series that's traveled around 
Boston, we've had seven shows, five college performances in addition. It's going to be on national television in two weeks. Very excited. And what we did was we put just stories front and center. And I'll never forget the woman who came up to me at the first show and said, okay, I came to this because I thought I had to. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what that means. But she says, I thought it was just going to be really depressing stories of refugees because it was billed as help refugees because the funding was going to refugees. And she says, I was really surprised by what I saw. There was like humor on stage. And there was an immigrant telling a story about a refugee. And then there was me, like white girl talking about a refugee, right? And she said, I think I get it. You're trying to find the things we have in common, not the identity politics. And I said, I think we're trying to do both. And some shows we did better than others. But what I love, the one thing that brought me joy is being backstage and watching the tellers, some of whom have never told, 21 of the 32 people had never shared their stories walk off stage and suddenly see themselves in somebody else. It was the daughter of the Holocaust survivor hugging the Congolese genocide survivor and neither of them ever having met anybody from those groups. We may not have transformed the, the bigger society, but I know, even through the power of Facebook, mm -hmm. suddenly all these relationships are forming. And I think through that, as we saw to, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but I learned this lesson, and it's gonna be a weird comparison, but it just got, reminded me of this. The LGBTQ marriage equality has been often, I hate not saying it's the heterosexuals, but it was when people who were straight came up and said, my life has been impacted by someone who's LGBTQ. It requires people who are non-immigrants to say how your life has been impacted. Um, and that's not to say we shouldn't make front and center voices of immigrants, but we shouldn't be afraid to talk about immigration if we're not. I'm gonna to try to tackle both uh, Harla and the changing the narrative questions. Um, I wanna first stress what Cheryl said about the importance of the social connection. Um, I remember being 18 and moving here um, and calling my mom the, the first day I got here and asking how to make eggs. And she started crying. Um, and I still don't know how to cook today because I've never <laughs> called. I've never called again. Um, so when you move, and I can speak English pretty well, so. I think you, for, you people lose sight of how hard it is to move to a new country and how the small things are things we don't need, even think about. So connect with, with someone and just go out. Like, don't just tell them to meet you somewhere. Go to Lowell and take the train down and do the, the very simple things that you take for granted but that people need help with. And I think that it's so time consuming for one organization of seven people to do. But if you have one connection and we all have one connection, we can, we can really make a difference. Um, on the question of American versus connected, I don't think there's any one-line answer I can give you that'll be satisfying. It's, a, it's an issue I grapple with every day, and I always think, am I being Arab enough? Am I being true to who I am? Uh, but I genuinely believe that I've been able, I've, I've had the privilege of living in, in many different countries, and I've never felt more comfortable than here. And unfortunately, it's, it's with the changes in the Middle East, I'm becoming more comfortable here than, than where I'm from. Um, but the, the next part of what you said is super important, which is fetishizing the exotic. Um, we struggled a lot with this when we were planning our storytelling event because we were, we basically had established these connections and I said to the Mercy folks, okay, you all have refugee friends now, who do you think would be great to come on stage and tell their story? And there was a lot of discomfort with even asking, but it turned out to be the other way. People wanted to share. And if I recall correctly, Shirley can correct me, nobody came up and said, you know, I remember being on the boat, I remember like the, 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 uh, the yeah. stereotype of what you'd expect a narrative of, of a refugee to be was not at all there. Mm -hmm. It was what, what meant to people most about their journey and it really differed and varied. But it's something so important to keep in mind as we have these discussions because it's a mental heuristic sometimes, but we have to be very respectful of people's experiences and how traumatic that can be to retell. And, and I'll end very quickly with the changing the narrative. Um, so, so I think as an Arab Muslim man, it's so easy for me to be in this bubble right here in Massachusetts and, and have people be very accepting and welcoming. Um, it's, it's, it would be awesome to never have to leave Cambridge. But I think what the last election told us is how much of a bubble it is. Um, I remember the day after the election, it, it's, I, I hate to make an analogy to like, you know, like you remember where, where you were when JFK died. I remember when I found out the result of the election very well and who I was with um, because nobody saw it coming. And the entire Kennedy School was like, what the hell? Um, 
and it's because we've been living in our bubbles and not going out. So I think it's I think it is incumbent on me to go meet people who are from the other side to say, it, I, I genuinely don't think that they're they have nefarious intentions. They just have they're ignorant. They have a, a stereotype in their mind of what it is to be Arab and Muslim and the news and what's happening with, with terrorism around the world isn't helping. Uh, but there are a lot of Arabs who are not associated with any of that. And for us to, to, to step out of the bubble and the comfort and talk to people and, and make connections across the aisle, I think helps changing the narrative. And I do think it's incumbent on us because, uh, again, I think I have a tremendous amount of privilege to be here. And even folks who are resettled, they're, they're the lucky ones. They've, they've made it out. Um, and so we should, we should, we can help in changing that narrative to give back. Um, I think for me, I'm going to try and answer as many of the questions that were um, posed. Um, the balance between being African and Zimbabwean to me is something I'll probably be working out for the rest of my <laughs> life. It's very difficult. Um, but I think one of the things is I acknowledge the, the different sides of me. I acknowledge both their strengths and weaknesses in both, and I try and do my best to sort of merge the best things um, and sort of leave behind what I don't think is functional. And I would say the perk of you know, having a whole other set of skill sets is that I can sort of pick and choose when I like. For example, um, when my son was born, I carried him on my back with a piece of material. It was like $5, if that. And I didn't spend tons and tons of money on a baby beyond and all this weird, strange, <laughs> crazy things. And I was like, this makes no kind of sense. For a hundred and something dollars, I can just, you know, get old school and go village, you know? And I did it. So, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. I think I pick and choose what, what makes sense. Um, and I think because I have, a I have a son and he is second generation, you mentioned that, I have to be very intentional. We have to be very intentional about making sure he knows where he's from. And I do have to acknowledge that I am privileged in this sense that A, I carry an American passport, so technically, hopefully, I won't be thrown out. But B, it also means when I go home to my native country, I am a foreigner. Um, and, and that in itself is somewhat problematic because I'll go to the airport and they'll be speaking in my native tongue and trying to get extra money from me. And I'm like, I know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> no, I'm not going to give you extra. You know, so there's that. And then, the, the, and then everyone in my country is like, well, where are you from? And I'm like, what do you mean, where am I from? And I'm speaking in my native tongue and I'm like, I'm very Zimbabwean. And they're like, uh, no, you, are you from Barbados? And I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> People don't see me. And it's, it's really quite interesting not being seen there. And the same thing happened here. But I think really it's just a question of you holding on to what makes you you, um, sort of finding home where you are. Um, the other thing I would say is um, in response to sort of the, um, the exoticism factor. Um, as an artist, one of the things that I try and do, and Cheryl gave me the opportunity to share my story, um, one suitcase story she mentioned. Um, and so I shared a story, Seed, Soil and Water, about my experience of coming to America. And I, I chose specifically that aspect because to change the narrative, because people assume if you're African, you came because you know, you're poor and starving or there was war, and that's not how I came. I came voluntarily on the plane, said, bye, mom, I want to go find myself, and I did. And I came, so, so you know, so it, and that's a very different scenario than you're used to. And so for me, it was really important for pe to remind people that there are multiple layers of ways in which you can be. And so it is my duty as a privileged African, as a privileged American, is to use that platform to be able to support. How do I do that? I was telling Cheryl earlier, last year when the election, the day of the election, made, <laughs> I was so traumatized. I was crying and weeping and screaming. And I was like, what am I going to do? And so someone sent me something from the Center of New Americans, and it was a fundraising event for writing poetry um, every day in the month of November, and to support um, immigrant initiatives, um, to, you know, citizenship classes. And so I'm like, this is it. This is something I can do. I am writing poetry, um, you know? So I wrote poetry, I raised some money, and I felt really good, and so that was something that I could actionably do to change um, how I was feeling and to really be part of it. The other thing is just really being involved in connecting with organizations that work and support immigrants here in America, even dance companies. For example, Danza Organica, you mentioned Puerto Rico and climate um, change. And uh, so I am a resident poet in a dance company, and they do a lot of work around social change. But most recently, they just debuted a piece dedicated to Puerto Rico, and it also was a fundraiser. And they raised $5,000 to donate to five different organizations in Puerto Rico 
Mexico who are doing work right now in terms of rebuilding. So I'm being connected to organizations like that or Africans for Improved Access and they do a lot of work around HIV education, particularly to the African communities in Massachusetts. So things like that are ways in which I feel that I can make some kind of um, change or ripple or connection. And as I mentioned before, just being present with my students in the classroom, allowing them to bring their whole selves in here and finding people to come in to guest um, speakers in the class who reflect the diversity to give them that different narrative too. Um, so it's not just, oh, you know, a Congolese person came from the war and they're mm -hmm. not doing anything, but hey, they were a doctor and they started a nonprofit or mm -hmm. different things like that. So. You can see her on the World Channel on November 20th. <laughs> Don't miss it. <laughs> World Channel, November 20th. She'll be featuring, she's the opening act. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are oh, out of time. time. Oh, Anita, um, sorry. No, no. This was so <laughs> inspiring. I <laughs> So, and I want to thank, again, thank our panelists, first of all.